Hi everyone, I'm pleased to welcome you to this talk by Enge Nissen, titled Planetary Movements, Willing, Acting, Knowing. Um, my name is Eugene Brennan and uh, we're hosting this talk with the University of London Institute in Paris, taking place within the context of a seminar series, Theory and Crisis, which we launched last year and has been fundamentally about questioning how we approach the activity of theorizing in times of crisis, how such moments exacerbate the challenging of periodizing and representing any experience of the presence. This has entailed looking at recent manifestations of crisis, such as accelerating financialization, as well as neoliberalism's authoritarian turn. And um, this was the context of uh, the last talk in the series by Veronica Gago, a recent talk on feminist international, which unpacks the notion of feminist strike. How do actors forge possibility out of constraints has been a, a guiding question throughout the series. Crisis is not simply a context one can point at for a simplistic, all-encompassing explanations. Crisis is, in fact, a problematic for thought and action, one whose outcomes resist speculative predictions. While much of the focus of the series has been oriented towards the recent crises of capitalism, um, talks last year by Etienne Balibar and Ashley Mbembe drew attention to the sorts of macro historical questions necessary to think about climate disaster. The uneven layering of different times within a social formation leads to a fractured experience of the presence in terms of non-contemporaneity or a discordance of source social times. The climate crisis and the periodizing narrative of the Anthropocene exacerbate these issues and demand we think the contemporary moments at not only a global, but a planetary level. This is the challenge Engen Eisen responds to in today's talk, suggesting that the planetary is not merely a scale, but a stage of politics. He'll focus in particular on contemporary social movements, inviting us to reconsider them as planetary movements. Many of you are no doubt familiar with Engen's work, um, so I'll just say a few brief words of introduction. Engen is a professor of international politics at Queen Mary University of London. He is also the founder and designer of the international Pro politics programs at ULUP. He's worked closely with us and been a, an amazing colleague and friends for a number of years. So it's a particular pleasure for us to host him today. Engen's work has been broadly concerned with how people constitute themselves as agents of international politics through acts movements and struggles. He's been a leading scholar in critical citizenship studies, um, where conventional understandings of citizenship, citizenship might emphasize its boundedness within the terms of the nation states. Engen's work has been interested in how citizenship and alterity emerge as conditions of one another. In books such as Being Political, he traced a series of histories of citizenship from the point of view of its alterities, recovering solidaristic, agonistic and alienating moments of reversal and transvaluation, where strangers and outsiders constituted themselves as political subjects and doing so altered ways of being political. In more recent works, such as Citizens Without Frontiers, Engen continued to develop a highly illuminating way of theorizing citizenship in terms of the heterogeneous acts in contemporary politics, where subjects act against, across and beyond the figurative and literal frontiers that constrain them. More recently, again, in Being Digital Citizens, co-authored with Evelyn Rupert, they similarly considered the performative acts of citizenship in the specific context of the digital, illustrating how digital citizens constitute themselves as political subjects. This book fed into a recent article titled The Birth of Sensory Power, which offers a compelling reading of our contemporary moments in terms of the emergence of a new form of power, sensory power, um, articulated and nestling into existing forms of power as described by Foucault, Deleuze and others. These are just some of Engen's um, major contributions um, to research in recent years. And the subject of today's talk is perhaps a more recent development or turn in his research. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing about it as I'm sure you all are. So I won't delay any further and it's my pleasure to hand you over to Engen. Thanks very much. Eugene, thanks very much for that kind introduction, as well as uh, for in inviting me to speak in the series. I've been following the series since its beginning. Um, uh, it's been a fascinating uh, experience, and I'm absolutely um, delighted to be uh, here today. And really, I've been looking forward to this. Um, I'd like to start also uh, by thanking uh, 
Angharad Close Stevens and Martina Tazzioli, uh, who invited me um, a few months ago to write an afterword to their fantastic volume of essays on collective mobilizations creating new political spaces. Um, little did I know when they invited that my thoughts would rapidly accelerate into thinking about the planetary. Uh, partly inspired by also a number of speakers in the series, but also uh, readings of uh, recent contributions by Deepesh Chakrabarty, uh, Bruno Latour, um, William Connolly, and so on. Um, so I began thinking about um, um, how we might think about the present, the present condition uh, where we are facing the planetary. I will explain various angles of that as well as uh, the broader history of social movements. So I'll briefly provide a background where um, and how I see the overlaps and connections between these two terms that constitute the concept that I want to propose today. This will allow me to acknowledge some of my debts to those scholars whose work on movements and the planetary have inspired me to take up this challenge. But I want to hopefully spend the bulk of my time with the qualities of what I call planetary movements. Uh, this is because I want to be provocative and generate critical questions, and I hope that there will be many at the end of this uh, discussion. Now, diverse but resonant social movements mark the beginning of our young 21st century with several emergent qualities. There are far too many mentioned here, but no one is illegal, Idle No More, Ed Busters, the Narmada Resistance, Black Lives Matter, Roads Must Fall, Me Too, Extinction Rebellion will signify immediately uh, different qualities when we compare with 19th and 20th century movements, uh, such as international congresses of working peoples, working class movement, women's movement, anti-slavery, anti-colonial, anti-war, anti-racist uh, movements, feminist movement later in the um, uh, 20th century, queer, trans, indigenous, and environmental movements. There are continuities with these movements of, um, of the 20th, uh, 19th and 20th century movements, but also there are significant breaks. Uh, the 21st century movements seem to traverse each other quite differently. Uh, solidarity between oppressed, dispossessed, and displaced peoples and movements against sexual, racial, national, and class domination seem to coalesce, intensify, and diffuse around specific campaigns, even in the way in which I have mentioned their names um, sound different. Uh, the 21st century movements are quite campaign-like movements with various intensities um, changing over time and, and um, resonance. And they also typically, 21st century movements seem typically mount resistances of all sorts against domination um, by seemingly exceeding signifiers such as international, global, or transnational. Um, they seem to play out on a different stage. Now, the naming of the present as the planetary is also happening as a movement but it seems to um, lead a parallel, although intersecting life uh, with, with uh, social movements. And I want to capture this parallel, but possibly intersecting nature of, on the one hand, the planetary condition and the social movements changing character, changing qualities of social movements, and whether we can theorize the present differently. So in that sense, the lecture is an invitation really to interpret these movements as planetary movements through various propositions or qualities that I'm going to develop. I will group them into willing, knowing and acting um, to look at various aspects of how these movements are functioning at this as I see them. But before then, I will provide a background on two powerful imaginaries that marked um, the, 20, uh, mark the 21st century and 20th centuries. Um, one is a global imaginary, um, 
let me just actually move to global imaginary before I talk about that's better the global imaginary now what I'm going to do is I'm not really speaking about globalization or any other terms that describe uh, certain attendant facts or realities that might be happening in the 20th century but the talk about the talk the discourse on globalization and I call this uh, global imaginary and want to look at some aspects of this imaginary in three different moments. I call them moments because I don't want to actually identify these dates as any turning points or transformative points. They are in some ways quite arbitrary, but I want to go um, into the formation of the global imaginary through three moments and articulate their differences and what I want to identify as uh, components of this global imaginary and I don't want to do this also in a linear sequential way and that's why I'm going to first start the emergence of a global imaginary since the second world war roughly from 1945 to 1989 and then flash back before 1945 and then fast forward since 1989 and that's the way I'm going to capture the emergence of the global imaginary and the search of a location for politics. Now, many political struggles have been named as social movements between 1945 and 1989. Social justice movements in the global north, including resistances against class, race, gender oppressions, and against authoritarianism and decolonization movements in the global south, marks this period. Uh, when we look at anti-slavery and anti-colonial resistances, working class struggles, civil and human rights movements, women's rights, gender uh, rights, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer uh, mobilizations, the rights for minorities, migrant and refugee rights, animal rights, environmental movements with all their differences, tensions, overlappings and contradictions have indelibly produced very significant uh, different uh, politics in this period 1945 to 1989. Um, I'm quite careful not to um, give agency necessarily to theory in terms of understanding these movements. These movements have their own self-reflexive understanding of themselves as movements. So the term movement is not necessarily used in theory primarily, although it is used in this period, but also movements self-reflection on themselves is very much influenced by the idea of being a movement as opposed to, let's say, party or any type of political organization that we may have been familiar with. So the movement is a quite essential um, angle of self-understanding and reflexivity in these political struggles. But it also happens that the study of social movements were quite quick to identify the term as early as 19 um, mid uh, 40s and providing insights for organizing our understanding of politics which would otherwise that is politics or movements otherwise have remained blind to change in means differentiation of ends and proliferation of claims and demands for which such for such struggles were waged uh, very quickly mentioning uh, Donatella Della Porta's work, uh, Doug McAdam, Sidney Terrell, uh, Charles Tilly, and numerous others studied the conditions under which collective action can exercise power and transform the conditions about which it has claims and demands. And it produced significant language as well as analytical insights how to understand the exercise of power by collectivities. The social movements in the global north and the post-colonial and decolonial movements in the global south have taken broader importance in this period, yet still remaining within states and nations in articulating their demands and claims to the state. So in this period, what we experienced between 1945 and 1989, um, various social movements are being interpreted 
And yet their claims and demands often remain within the boundaries and categories of state, nation, and, um, and the constitutional and legal systems in which they are located. There are, of course, resonances and sharing of experiences among these movements, but they can't really yet be called global movements. That is to come later, at least in my lecture. Um, now, let me just flash back into another period and perhaps identify one of the most significant um, achievement of these movements, not necessarily between 1945 and 1989 in actual social political struggles, claiming and gaining rights, uh, performing those rights, instituting legal and political transformations to inhabit those rights. Uh, those accomplishments have been incredible uh, in such a short period of time. As important as these um, uh, gains have been, there was something yet else um, that was really fundamentally transformative. Um, what I would say that in this period between 1945 and 1989, new subjects of history have been brought into being. Uh, Eric Wolfs uh, popularized the term, the people without history, and I think it was used already by Marx in one of his writings. And Eric Wolf was quite at pains. Uh, the original book was published in 1982. And in 1990s, when the second uh, edition came, um, uh, became published, he was at pains to describe that he did use it ironically. He didn't mean that there were people without history. But in fact, there were people without history in historical narratives which we inhabited up until then. And what we have experienced between 1945 and 1989, peasants, slaves, indigenous peoples, women, workers, students, soldiers with conscience, the oppressed and the colonized were also brought into being historically. Their histories were written. Um, classical histories of Greece and Rome have been rewritten by taking into account of women's struggles, slave revolts, peasant uprisings, and, uh, and organizing, we have began observing and seeing different uh, subjects of history being written uh, into history. Um, we have seen slave revolts uh, being included in our historical narratives. Indigenous peoples have made themselves into history as subjects of history, women, workers, students, and I've uh, giving you a list that is only a short one, but many, many accounts of this. So not before 1945, um, we cannot speak of social movements as such because the word and self-description did not exist. But between 45 and 1989, it was not just a contemporization of social movement, but also historically changing what counted as a political struggle. And this is really significant as I'm trying to capture with the global imaginary as um, writing uh, peoples without history into history that we have experienced. Now, what's been happening since 1989? We have been witnessing the emergence of what we come to call global social movements. Um, that addition of global, the adjective that describe the signifier to social movements meant number of things. Although originating from within specific states and nations, they were organized and mobilized differently. Um, as I mentioned in, in my introductory remarks, even these movements naming signifiers feel um, different. The globe became increasingly articulated as the stage on which these movements carried out their struggles against domination and creating alternative mobilizations gained momentum on which movements carried um, uh, momentum through an international human rights movement, as well as world social forums between 2001 and 2018, and likely to continue. These were increasingly interpreted as international movements, transnational movements, and global movements in the literature, as well as those movements began signifying, defining themselves as international, global, uh, transnational. Uh, resistances to financial crises, the uprising uh, 
against authoritarian regimes, autonomous movements of migrants and refugees, and the movements in solidarities were all waged globally, still performing national struggles, but having much more resonance in terms of the claims that have been uh, forwarded, the, the demands that have been articulated, having broader reach than in any given nation state, although they may be staged in uh, in a particular nation state. So there's an ontological shift in politics. The place of politics is shifting. And for the longest time, for the last 20 years, I think in the literature as well as within movement themselves, um, this diffusion of politics have been interpreted as global social movements, which increasingly perhaps is inadequate to think in terms of uh, their nature of politics and the kind of um, performances that they bring about, which brings me to, to this second imaginary I want to speak about, and that's the planetary imaginary. The planetary imaginary is not independent from the development of these movements. Obviously, environmental movement and the articulation of the Earth um, as a common habitat of humanity has had major impact on the emergence of planetary imaginary as a movement. And it came out of environmental and ecological movements that have histories. But nonetheless, in the uh, recent period, we have seen also a shift in the planetary imaginary, a new articulation, a new location for that kind of politics, which I believe actually crisscrosses now into other social movements and come together as planetary movements. But before I make that point, let me um, continue with the planetary imaginary. Again, in three moments and three incongruous moments, they are not necessarily um, uh, linear movements. But let's take a look at between 1968 and 1987. Very quickly reminding 1968 can be, again, these are rather arbitrary, but symbolic moments with which to think about the emergence of the planet, uh, planetary emerge, um, imaginary. In 1968, um, during the Apollo and Soyuz missions, astronauts and cosmonauts often expressed how leaving the planet Earth made them realize they were its inhabit inhabitants. And incredibly, in 1969, within a year, um, the Gaia hypothesis of, um, that Earth is a complex system regulating itself involving the biosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the pyrosphere were being articulated. The congruence between the two, the resonance, cannot have been coincidental, that the uh, becoming aware of the Earth as our habitat, as it, were, as it were. And just about the same time in that period between 68 and 1987, we see social movements taking on a significantly environmental take, such as the formation of Greenpeace and the Earth uh, First, but at the same time, older struggles uh, getting articulated into environmental movements as peace movements. So women strike for peace in 1961, for example, articulates into 1982, one million march in New York against nuclear arms race. Um, these are related and connected phenomena and yet um, staged and understood differently in, in parallel terms. But between 68 and 1987, there is that kind of articulation that the concern is shifting, the ontological uh, tectonic, as it were, um, of, of politics is changing. Now, that doesn't mean before 1968 that there was no such awareness, becoming aware of the earth. I would single out, for example, anarchism as a movement, not only in movement in thought and in theory, but actual movement um, of struggles already articulated on the one hand anti-property and anti-capitalist stance, but also very much deeply articulated itself with the condition of the earth and our relationship as species to the earth. Uh, two significant um, thinkers of that was were obviously for me uh, Henry David Thoreau and Elise Reclus. Both of them have laid the ground to think about the earth uh, 
in quite different ways and articulating already an anti-capitalist anti imaginary, particularly revolving around the question of property in 1920s. Um, so th they mostly did this uh, in the uh, um, late 19th century and the early 20th century. But in the 20th century, um, there was an increasing movement of understanding and re-articulating our relationship to the earth by organizing and reorganizing how we settled the earth, urbanism movement, regional planning and regional politics movement. In 1923, for example, the Regional Planning Association of America with Lewis Mumford already articulated a very strong politics against fossil fuels and declared the end of car already before the car, the automobile became the um, the ubiquitous technology of the 20th century with its all um, uh, consumption of fossil fuels and the extractivism that it perpetrated. That was in 1923. In 1942, um, only within uh, two decades of that development, a Kistix movement uh, named by Doxiadis, um, Konstantinos Doxiadis, a, a, um, a, another environmentalist and um, habitat and settlement settlement advocacy, urging us to think about how we settle the earth and rethink the ways in which we build uh, cities. So between 1968 and 1987, there may have been some articulation of consciousness about the earth and how we inhabit it, but there were significant precursors as social movements themselves. And the subsequent movements could only have been built on the basis of these movements. And I would say that that's what's happening since 1987 has to be also articulated and interpreted that way, building on the 19th and 20th century movements, social movements, but using different languages, articulating different co concerns. When we look at what's happening since 1987, I picked 1987 as the publication year of the Brundtland Report, our common future. Um, articulating the present and the future at the same time and, are, and identifying its commonness and using that term our understanding of sustainability of the earth and the systems that the Gaia hypothesis articulated, their, uh, their possibility of sustaining our lives. But within a year of that, 1988, the founding of Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, as a United Nations body, is another significant uh, moment. And of course, 1995 Berlin, the first conference of the parties, COP summit to assess progress in dealing with uh, climate change, which we recently had uh, 26th of those meetings. Um, now, these all brought into being um, a particular becoming aware of the earth, a consciousness, in a way that perhaps it wasn't possible in these terms before 1987, but the urgency, if not the emergency, of articulating a certain horizon and naming of the present, naming of the epoch, our own epoch, with a geological um, temporal category, Anthropocene shifted the ontological uh, situation significantly. We are now realizing that the planetary movements, these connections that I'm making are not only between temporal, that is geological or historical, but also between and across spatial imaginaries. And it requires understanding these movements as social movements, historically and geographically. In a way, in a way, what I'm going to propose that quite similar to writing subjects into history, that I consider as social movements major accomplishment, writing subjects without history into history, that this recent phase, nine, since 1987, what happened is that the earth has been written back into history. And I have, of course, I'm inspired by Deepesh Chakrabarti's Climate of History, as well as Bruno Latour's uh, Facing Gaia. In, despite differences, the argument uh, for example, for Deepesh uh, uh, Chakrabarti is that we can no longer write human history independent of geological history. Therefore, we need to begin to interpret, we need to begin 
to experiment with writing our own history along with our involvement and embodiment in the earth, which we might then call geohistory. And Bruno Latour's brilliant uh, contribution has been, perhaps this moment is when we are restoring agency to the earth, that the earth has its own systems and uh, regulatory mechanisms and complex um, um, uh, elements that is not passive extractivist object that we can play on, but we have to work with and restoring agency. Again, from my point of view, perhaps we are at that moment where we are restoring, um, we, are, we, are, we are writing Earth's history into history. So this naming of naming as a condition rather than an epoch, that is at a moment that we are considering that humans impact on on the earth is more significant than any other. Therefore, our um, epoch has to be thought differently. Introduce a new consciousness or awareness into politics and Isabel Stenger's uh, contribution to think about that, Donna Haraway's opening up of the concept of Anthropocene in different directions, Bill Connolly's intervention in thinking about how, these, um, how this awareness can be connected with uh, politics, Bruno Latour's intervention have been really significant al along with Ashil Mbembe, Dipesh Chakrabarti, and in fact Etienne Balibar in this series. For me, I'm going to draw two major conclusions from this for us as the necessity to think of the planetary with social movements and conceptualize them as planetary movements. The first consequence, the first conclusion that I draw is that the naming as a condition, not necessarily the name itself, or where we might actually draw its boundaries, that there is an urgency emerge at this point in time to name our epoch on this condition, um, differentiate the notion of international, global, or transnational politics, because the planetary is not a scale. It's an ontological entry into politics, um, taking into account of ourselves and our relationship to Earth is a fundamentally transformative uh, moment in political theory as we know it. It is not just simply a scale, but a stage, a, a space of politics that transgresses the boundaries and in fact abolishes them imposed on this politics, at least in the last 500 years. Planetary movements are not a passive expression of this, but it's active performative force. In other words, this identification, this urgency, is not on the basis of independently discovered facts to which we must pay attention to, but in fact, social movements have brought us into this moment, the possibility of organizing ourselves to name this epoch at this point in time this way. This is uh, one conclusion that I draw that I think is important for thinking planetary movements. The second one is the conclusion is that the, it reveals that diverse social movements and their struggles create a frontier traversing the planet, solidarity between oppressed, dispossessed, and displaced peoples and movements against sexual, racial, and class domination cannot take place independently of from one another or from the condition of the planetary. These are part of the same struggle. We now recognize that each struggle joins the other and that the emancipation from domination must be across all forms of domination. That is a key element of planetary movements. It cannot take place in one domain and then remain the same in another domain. To put it differently, the planetary perspective joins all the struggles against domination of peoples by peoples, species by species, and as I will argue, planets by planets. This is the transversal logic of planetary movements, which I will articulate. Boaventura de Souza Santos often said during World Social Forums of the significance of translation between different mov movements. I'm going to argue that the planetary or facing the planetary 
does that translation if you pay attention to it. So what are the qualities of planetary movements then? Let me now switch um, number of propositions that I've developed, certain qualities. Um, I divided them into three, and it just ended up that in each there are four, so altogether 12 propositions. Um, they're willing, knowing, and acting. Um, those of you who are interested in more systematic, uh, systemic aspects of philosophy, you can also map these as ontological, epistemological, and methodological considerations on planetary movements. But these are teased out. These are learned from the movements themselves by various observations and um, communications. So I consider these as incipient qualities. They are not necessarily facts to be found on the ground as such, but I am not necessarily pulling them out of my hat either. Um, there is a certain solidity to, the, to these claims, but they are performative claims by a particular reading of these uh, movements. I'm going to start with willing, mobilizing desire and effect. Uh, this obviously comes from my um, uh, historical readings of how social groups and social movements come into being, what uh, gathers them together, the kinds of claims and demands that they articulate. One of the most significant thing about them is organizing willing and desire and effect that mobilizes those who are involved in this movement enough so that they are invested themselves in it without a certain um, orientation, a horizon of organizing, um, organizing desire and effect, movements will not come into being. W what, is, what is then mobilizing the desire and effect in planetary movements? Four propositions. One, what makes the kinds of movements that we now bring under planetary is not a scale, but way of seeing, I said that, a perspective. Let's just articulate some of the consequences of this. It's a plan if it is a planetary imaginary, these movements are planetary because they often resist seeing like the state or empire or corporation. If war has been the primary mode of domination in the last five to 6,000 years, no less, and especially in the last 500 years, organizing humanity around conquest, planetary movements reverse this with a focus on the planet Earth as humanity's incontestably common habitat. This simultaneously places humans in a predicament for interspecies solidarity, for being the species having now had the decisive impact on this common habitat. Planetary movements are neither merely about human species themselves, it's not about us only, nor about the planet Earth itself, but the planet Earth as the common habitat of all planetary species. Planetary movements replace war with care. The opposite of war is not peace. War with care as a condition of life on the planet Earth itself. Uh, during the COP26, there were some media uh, mainstream media reporting of how the young generation is feeling anxious about the planetary condition, the climate change and the climate emergency. And um, a few young um, activists, when asked, they said, we are not anxious, we are angry. Right on. That's exactly the response in terms of mobilizing uh, desire and effect. Second one, the term planetary is only a shorthand. Planetary movements make us recognize that they are movements with an interplanetary or interstellar space. If planetary movements orient toward the planet Earth with care, this also places planetary species in relation to interplanetary and yet unknown species. Planetary movements recognize that humans have already had an impact on other planets and they reject colonization of space for military and corporate conquest. We already know the consequences of terra nullius, nobody's land, on indigenous peoples, beginning with Australia. We can only imagine catastrophic consequences of nobody's space, that is 
conquest of space as though no other species is present. Planetary movements are opposing military state and corporate colonization of interstellar um, space precisely because we don't even have a yet name for the epoch where we have made an impact on other planets, but we have. We already talk about uh, space junk. We are already waging wars with the uh, with um, uh, pseudonyms or or, or um, ideologies like peace and exploration in space. We are exploding asteroids to see if rockets can actually change their directions. We are already making this impact, and planetary movements are acutely aware of this. And many of them said. Um, say, never again with respect to 1492. You will know what that means. Planetary movements, third one. Uh, planetary movements fundamentally alter the governor and governed relationship modeled after master-slave relationship. James Scott, in a recent book, reminds us that for 6,000 years now, with the beginnings of the state as a polity, the relationship between governor and the governed has been predicated on master-slave relationship. The states have partitioned the planet Earth and domesticated the peoples of the Earth into sedentary peoples that organize effective relations of humans for life and death. Planetary movements inculcate effective affinities within across and outside human species, unmediated by states and corporations, that occupy, sequester, and exploit their effective affinities. They gather people as inhabitants of the planet Earth with their fellow non-human species. The horizon of expectation, the horizon of affinity and loyalty, here as a slave, a long master-slave uh, relationship, as the governed, is not toward any singular polity. This fundamentally um, changes that. These movements may make claims on states, have to make claims to nations and corporations, but they don't evaluate life and death from their perspectives. The governor-governed relationship is being transformed. One of the things that I love about James Scott's book is that its problematization of uh, the, the phrase um, domestication of plants and animals as though that domestication of plants or animals occurred independently of domestication of humans. Slavery was born out of that moment of domestication of plants and animals, domestication of peoples by people. That is a significant moment five, six thousand years ago uh, in the articulation of polities which determine our lives today. Um, the other thing that I really appreciate about James Scott's book is that it is um, uh, put forward as one which written by from the, from the point of view of barbarians. It is yet another stage in the process of writing subjects or people without history into history, where it's making it at, at actually principle of writing history from the point of view of um, barbarians. Finally, in terms of uh, thinking about how um, planter movements are organizing activities of willing desire and effect. They display, they displace binarism as a condition of life. This is a complex one. The either or blackmail, as though decisionism can determine fate of the planet Earth and its species, is displaced in planetary movements with a critical attitude of neither nor. Anytime planetary movements are blackmailed with by and either or decisionism, their immediate response is neither nor. This response is not indecision in my view, but undecidability. We cannot sort things out with predetermined terms of debate without negotiating them. The response neither nor opens a space for working out disagreements and disaffections to reach out divergent possibilities. The emerging political spaces we are seeking to disclose are already embodied in the displacement of such binaries. Migrants or citizens, deserving or undeserving, legal or illegal, regular or irregular, excluded or included, masculine or feminine, local or global, 
revolution or reform, nature or culture? The answer, neither nor. It was World Social Forums that made it popular, Another World is Possible, and the planetary movements um, often practice that specifically. Now, I'm going to switch to second set of propositions, and this is mostly about epistemological considerations. How do we know? When do we know? Who knows? Uh, issues of justice, truth, and um, negotiation. How, how do these things are elaborated in planetary movements? Again, number of propositions. I'm imagining, before I begin my epistemological considerations, immediately a question that arises. Are all international, um, transnational, or global movements also planetary movements? Is capitalism not a planetary movement? Is racism not a movement? of planetary proportions? Is nationalism? Is fascism? Is jihadism? Is patriarchy not a planetary movement? Capitalism and nationalism in the last 200 years. Racism and imperialism and colonialism in the last 500 years. Religion in the last 2,000 years and patriarchy in the last 5,000 years have been movements rest restlessly traversing the planet Earth and dominating peoples and other species. That these movements traverse the planet Earth does not mean, and it doesn't make them, planetary movements. They have been movements of enslavement and domination that endanger all species. I propose that we confine the concept planetary movements to those that claim, demand, articulate, and enact emancipation from all forms of domination. So domination and resistance and domination are fundamental categories of planetary movements. Planetary movements are resistances against domination of peoples by peoples, species by species, and planets by planets. They do not mobilize for negative freedom. They seek emancipation from domination as injustice institutionalized and maintained by state, corporate, and military forms. This becomes obvious to give one example. When national and international governing authorities in the global north frame population movements originating from the global south as migration and as movements to be controlled, managed, and regulated for the benefit of the global north and its structure of domination. From the perspective of planetary movements, they are people's movements, period. There are multiple concepts of justice and that there are such complexity to different forms of justice is not a daunting problem for planetary movements. It is in fact a resource. This is because the concept of justice often I see being mobilized in planetary movements. It's not a means and ends concept of justice, but a practical concept based on historical injustices arising especially from the last 5,000 years of sedentism, statism, extractivism, exploitation, slavery, racism, and patriarchy instigated by Euro-American imperialism, capitalism, and colonialism. Therefore, um, justice and injustice are not abstract concepts in the um, in generic mood, but it's historically grounded as that's been articulated by social movements themselves as movements against um, resistance against uh, domination. Therefore, justice is something that is articulated, negotiated, and um, sought collectively. Third proposition, the planetary movements, um, for them, conventions of truth-telling stand in dialogue with each other. Truth-telling conventions, such as sciences, arts, humanities, activism, journalism, and spirituality are understood as solidaristic yet agonistic conventions. The authority and legitimacy of a given convention derives from how and under what conditions its truth-telling reveals injustices suffered by domination of a people, a species, and a planet. Planetary movements practically understand 
that any truth-telling convention will have a specific history and it will bring to the dialogue its dynamic and changing principles. Working out what and how to know and who can know is a dialogue between these conventions. Planetary movements understand that domination of one convention leads to the domination of a people over another, a species over another. These conventions of truth-telling do not stand outside but inside planetary movements. They are part of movements themselves. This does not diminish the principle of objectivity for those who are in sciences, but it resignifies it. The principle of objectivity that characterizes truth-telling in sciences as planetary movements is not spectating but acting. This is one of the things that I love about Bruno Latour's book about the uh, face, um, facing a guy and, and, and also uh, down to earth is that his account of sciences not spent standing outside of the objects that they are advocating and investigating but inside as advocates how scientists themselves are increasingly considering themselves as agents in my terms planetary movements and this is an important aspect of understanding truth-telling not any single truth-telling convention can trump the other they are negotiated and this is an important realization in practical um, struggles now the greatest challenge in my view planetary movements face is how to resist domination without perpetrating it how do activists conduct themselves against domination without getting trapped in its repertoires can they avoid building ideologies institutions of domination it raises number of questions if indeed planetary movements are against domination of one people over another or one species over another and over a planet over another how do they mobilize and organize their will affect desire and pleasure with care without domination I'm going to now switch to the third. I'm not sure I'm doing well in my time, but I don't have much time left. In the next few minutes, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to make four more um, propositions. This time, the methodological considerations of how do planetary movements perform uh, themselves? How do they implement um, things? How do they do things with words? How does that work? in terms of their uh, relationships with, with each other, with, with, with our relationship with other species and the planets to consider. Um, the first one is taking up the challenge of resisting domination without domination. As I mentioned, planetary movements organize themselves in such ways that decisionism and hierarchism are checked simultaneously against indecisiveness and ineffectiveness and decisiveness and effectiveness are not quite what might seem. How to account for the organizational arrangements that develop in planetary movements? There have a number of anthropological studies, not least by David Graeber on direct action and how movements organize themselves and many others within social movement studies. But one that really um, uh, that I really appreciate uh, reading and, and I'm inspired by right now is Rodrigo Nunez's book on um, or, uh, move, um, organizations and he shows that there are always several metaphors in contention. Um, horizontal versus vertical, hierarchical versus non-hierarchical, network versus distributed and centralized versus decentralized. But what we see in planetary, planetary movements is a resistance against such binarism and practically inculcating transversal modes of organizing collective action. The logics of collective action in planetary movements are multiple and non-binary. There is no singular logic that can capture the ways in which planetary movements perform their repertoires of action. That we describe planetary movements as transversal does not mean there is a unifying logic that determines them but that planetary movements perform their actions by continuously crossing or rather traversing borders and boundaries. These borders and boundaries of capture include nations, states, corporations, empires, and, but also boundaries such as statuses, um, uh, 
categories, identities that planetary movements reassemble, re rearrange in creatively multiple ways. Planetary movements produce bricolor assembling actors who gather together various transposition from through which perform acts against domination. This is one of the most significant moments of convergence also in these moments, as I said, the different uh, conventions of truth telling. That's where art, science, performativity, performative arts, um, spirituality, uh, sciences all conjoin to explore different aspects of resistance against domination and come together in some legible and some very difficult ways. Um, the second proposition is that planetary movements are constituted by creative, autonomous and inventive acts. The fundamental category of understanding movements is acts. There are an infinite variety of repertoires with which to perform acts that break relations of domination. Planetary movements perform acts as if they were an experimental theatricality on a stage whose construction is part of their performance. In other words, planetary movements build the stages on which they uh, play out their acts of resistance. Their experimentalism, as the situation is internationally worked out, involves developing repertoires that can be assembled, reassembled, disassembled, used and reused. The dramaturgical character of planetary movements involves this work of assemblage and arrangement by working out various repertoires and experimenting with their effects. Peter Weibel's, Weibel's uh, work on global activism and critical zones are absolutely beautiful testament to this theatricality. On the other hand, numerous actors, what they do on the internet is another testament of this creativity. The, they have been, the internet has been both an embodiment and expression of this. Um, planetary movements continue to integrate online and offline activism in inventive and creative ways with repertoires to create spaces of resistance, despite the closing in of the internet, which I cannot go into at the moment. Um, the third is um, proposition in terms of acts becoming uh, fundamental key aspects of planetary movements is the planetary movements embody and express an essential aspect of life. When I say life, not only human life, life as we increasingly understand that takes place on Earth, its ebbs and flows in continuous but variable intensities. These movements generate restless intensities, but yet can vary these intensities, rest, evade, slow and then quicken and intensify again in an ongoing continuous manner. Those who see the drama of life as introduction, body and conclusion, the continuous and variable intensities with which planetary movements ebb and flow will be puzzling and unsettling. There will be questions asked about their beginning. There will be questions about their ends, yet planetary movements involve no originary movements or conclusive ends, but only continuous and variable intensities. A controversial proposition. The fourth and the final um, proposition about acts. If planetary movements mobilize against binarism, they also deconstruct all means and calculus expressed in and symbolized by instrumental and calculative logics. It's not that planetary movements perform a politics of means without ends or imagine ends without means. Planetary movements fundamentally alter the relationship between means and ends as incongruous, asynchronous and incalculable. The value of one cannot be derived from the other, but both can constitute generative parallels. And it is in those parallels and resonances that um, planetary movements do their work. Just to conclude, um, if there can be in fact a conclusion to the, these propositions, um, it is really quite significant to imagine um, acts as being key elements of these movements and the actors that emerge out of these not necessarily uh, purposeful, willing actors, but actors who are 
caught in these movements in various capacities. The key protagonists in this unfolding drama of life we are experiencing are assembling agents of different peoples, species, possibly planets, who assemble various positions from and through which to perform these acts of breaks against domination. 